When it comes to their resorts, consistency is Intercontinental's strength, and that certainly applies here in Fiji as well. We're going to take a full tour of all of the facilities, the food, my room, and more, so let's get into it. Welcome to Fiji. If you'd like to know the exact nightly rate that I paid for my stay, or my next 5 videos in queue, please check out the description below. And if you're new here, hi there and welcome to the channel, my name is Kevin. You found yourself on a channel that thinks that the world needs a bit more honest travel content. I make airline trip reports, high-end hotel reviews, and cruise ship tours as well, all without invitation. I always film without the company's knowledge to be sure to get a true experience. Then, all I can give you is my own personal, honest, unbiased opinion. One thing that I find Intercontinentals and maybe IHG resorts in general do really well these days is the sense of arrival that they build. It sounds maybe kind of silly out of context, but I think a long, well-manicured driveway is one of the more important but often overlooked details that really set the tone for a tropical or mountain resort. As you'll see in my next video of the Shangri-La, sometimes they set the wrong tone. This Intercontinental, originally opened in June of 2009, has a total of 266 rooms spread over 35 acres on the beautiful Natadola Bay. Due to the hilly topography of the resort, the arrival pavilion, which we're approaching now, is set a few stories above the beach level, affording beautiful views as you walk down the long corridor. Adding to that sense of arrival are the musicians who will be playing as you arrive, and then the cocktail which will be crafted at the small welcome bar on the left, to your preference, with local artisan spirits, serving as your welcome drink. Continuing down the corridor, we get our first sense of the design language of the hotel. Now, today, I'm not going to harp on this too much, as it's not that big of a deal, but throughout the resort, I do wish more natural materials were used. This property just has a whole lot of gray going on, and in general, while I do find that they feature many Fijian forms and structures, doing so exclusively with gray commercial materials doesn't exactly inspire a local heritage feel. Perhaps they're assuming that views like this would make up for that, and I, I do suppose that they do. The area that we just walked through is the primary reception area. Let's head down a level and begin to check out some of the facilities. Just below the arrival pavilion, you'll find a cultural bore, where some local crafts are sold throughout the day, as well as a mini mart, and the resort's largest restaurant, Sana Sana. Directly underneath the reception area, we have the Kama Lounge, which is an all-day bar and lounge where many of the evening's activities will be centered around. If you support the content that I've been putting out on the channel, or just honest travel content in general, please be sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. The two easiest ways that you can tell YouTube that this video was worth your time. For anyone interested in supporting, my Patreon is also linked in the description below. Many thanks for watching today. And here we have our first look at the beach. Let's take a closer look at where we actually are. On Fiji's main island of Viti Levu, the Intercontinental is surrounded by Natadola Bay on the southern coast, renowned for years as one of the most beautiful beaches on the island. From the airport in Nadi, it will usually take you just over an hour to get here. And like just about anywhere in Fiji, any taxis that you pick up at a taxi stand are generally A-OK -okay to use and have a fixed price fare structure, which they'll have a copy of in the car. Just be sure that you have cash. 
The arrival area where we just were is to the far left of the resort, with the heart of the property surrounding the two largest pools down in the middle. Let's take a walk to that area now. Intercontinental currently has 208 hotels and resorts worldwide, and its beginnings are truly one of the more fascinating startup stories that I've read in quite a while. In 1945, Juan Tripe, the founder and then president of Pan Am, was having breakfast at the White House with FDR, as one does. At the breakfast, they were talking about the need to attract investment into the Latin American region. And it was FDR's idea to do so by building luxury hotels for business people and tourists alike in the regions where they wanted to attract investment. Here we can see the putting green, which is just one of the many seemingly hidden Easter eggs throughout the property. FDR requested that Pan Am invest $50 million to develop 5,000 hotel rooms across Central and South America. At the time, Pan Am's annual profit was around $3 million, so the government provided a loan through the XM Bank for $25 million. The hotels were also meant to serve Pan Am crews across the region. For now, let's put a pin in that. Here we have one of the best designed pools that I think I've ever seen. First of all, it's huge. It's a large crescent shape and is shallow at the ends for kids and deeper in the middle for families. The smartest part to me though are the tarps above which provide plenty of shaded areas to stay out of the direct sun. As we walk around, I'll also bring your attention to the room surrounding the pool. My room was eligible for an upgrade, but one wasn't available. But I'm happy that it wasn't because it would have been to a pool view room, which just seems a bit closer to the action than I prefer. As you can see though, there are plenty of loungers and seats available without making you feel like you're on top of your pool neighbors. With the center of the large pool on the right, we're going to turn left into the Toba Bar and Grill, which serves lunch and dinner and pool snacks throughout the day. Walking straight through there, and we bring ourselves to the second largest pool. This one beachfront, and while not explicitly so, the pool was meant for a more adult crowd. In the evenings, you'll find live music in the courtyard here and the sun setting behind. The beach here is hard compacted sand with crystal clear waters which we'll get a better look at in a bit. Just near the shoreline is also a diving center which has its own training pool. Alright, let's head to my room. For this stay, my room was in an area which was completely walkable when coming down the hill but you'd probably want a buggy going back up. I had a garden view king room with a private outdoor terrace. If you're getting a garden view room, I highly suggest that you ask for one of the rooms on the end, if available, of course. All of the rooms in this part of the resort are in large structures that have three or four rooms in each house, with the end cap rooms feeling a bit more spacious and open outside. Inside, we still get a bit of that COVID treatment, still, as in, there's just not a lot of stuff in the room. Mm -hmm. 
The bedding and mattresses were very comfortable though, and much appreciated for a couple of nights in the middle of this very extended trip of mine. Welcome amenities included a handwritten note and fruit plate. As comfortable as the bed is though, these chairs have to be the most uncomfortable things that I've ever sat on. They are precisely as uncomfortable as they look. The mini bar was fine, coming with a few small bottles of water, and at least this time, I got a small French press instead of day after day after day after day of instant coffee in Fiji. Although I will note though, that this is the only resort that I stayed at in Fiji that actually did replenish your water supply. My desk was chairless, made me wonder if they're gonna come set up a buffet or something. After a few calls, I did get a chair, but ended up, I kid you not, sitting on the coffee table pulled up to the desk with a towel on top since that chair was also so uncomfortable. They just, they, they don't want you to sit down in here. Behind door number two, we find the bathroom, which was well outfitted and featured very nice pure Fiji white ginger lily products. The shower had a handheld as well as a small rainfall head, but hot water took forever. On this side, we have one of two closets. This one passes through to the other side as well, which was really handy, especially when packing up. And here's the second closet, and then we can head outside. The terrace had a nice large soaking tub and what amounted to be the most comfortable seating areas in the room. And here you can also see why the rooms on the end are a bit better. And if you're tall enough, this could qualify as an ocean view room. Now, my only real problem in the room was the cleanliness. So I have two types of cleanliness issues, gross stuff and not gross stuff. This was all in the not gross stuff category and there was nothing with months of buildup, but it certainly could have used a more detailed eye. For the record, my gross stuff category usually includes hairs and liquids. Okay, so who's staying here? Well, Intercontinental have a very large following and that alone makes up a sizable chunk of the guests. Most families that were here had preteens or teens and the majority of guests were actually couples in their 30s to 50s. All right, let's check out a bit of the beautifully landscaped grounds and head back down to the beachside to check out food and entertainment options. And I can finish up my story. For the years following the Exim Bank investment, 
Tripe and his team went on a fact-finding mission across multiple countries, essentially deciding where to start. Their first acquisition was the Hotel Victoria Plaza, which was already under construction in Montevideo, Uruguay. Projects in Venezuela, in Caracas, and Maracaibo followed, and by 1949, their first hotel opened in Belém, Brazil, and Santiago, Chile. Expansion was rapid to say the least, and in 1953, they opened the Hotel Tequendama in Bogotá, which was the largest hotel in South America at the time, and the first hotel developed, designed, and constructed 100% under the new Intercontinental brand. Fast forward to 1963, and they were already in Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and Australia, with their first U.S. property opening in San Francisco in 1973. For lunch or dinner, Toba features a typical hotel menu with a variety on offer. The meals I had here were actually pretty good. The first day for lunch, I had a tandoori chicken pizza, and another night had a chicken sandwich. It's a good spot for a quick, casual meal. When Pan Am was struggling financially, they sold off their profitable hotel chain to the Grand Metropolitan, a UK-based firm. In 1988, the hotel chain was purchased by Bass, as in Bass Brewery, and through a few company splits, essentially remains under the same ownership till this day. I suppose with an airline, a president, and a bit of beer, anything is possible. Soon after, the golden hour began to set in, and we were in for quite a treat over the beach. As for this specific intercontinental, it may not surprise you to know that it is owned by the Fiji National Provident Fund, aka the government, which has their hands in many tourism-related projects. For what it's worth, on this trip, I was at three resorts owned at least in part by the government, and one that was not. And the one that was not is the one that I would never return to. This is the end of the Kama Lounge we saw earlier, which is the hub for the pre-dinner cocktails, which were kicked off each evening with a torch lighting ceremony. For dinner, there were two other proper restaurant options. Fine dining at Navo, which I'll show you during breakfast, or something a little more smart casual at Sana Sana. I chose the latter. The menu was diverse and had quite a selection of dishes that were a fusion of Fijian and Indian cuisine, as is common on the islands. I had the onion fritters as an appetizer and a much more tropical fish option for the main. Both were tasty and the main dish was refreshingly not too heavy as much of the food tended to be at the resorts that I visited on the island. For breakfast, there were also two options. First, we'll take a look at the well-put-together buffet spread at Sana Sana. There was plenty of selection on offer, most of it standard buffet fare, but I was happy that they did have a few much more local feeling hot dishes as well.
and there was also a separate egg station. Navo is the second option for breakfast. Here you'll find a small continental buffet along with an a la carte menu for main dishes. Note that for breakfast, this is adults only. The buffet had much of the same cold foods as the Sana Sana buffet, and I ordered Eggs Benedict. The first time, I had to send them back because they were truly way underdone. I guess they didn't want to risk that again though, and the second time they came out overcooked. Still a nice hollandaise though, and service was good as well. Nearly insisting to remake them again, but I didn't want to waste more food. And my favorite part of the beach at the resort was actually over here on the side, just next to Navo. Service on a whole here was very good, but not personal. Lower touch, but more out of necessity than by design, considering the hotel was near at capacity. But again, the only service that I would really criticize in this case would be housekeeping. Last up, in addition to the kids club and spa, there is also of course a fitness center. So overall, it's a beautiful resort. Do I wish they had a bit more character and a bit less gray? Yes. Do I wish the rooms were cleaner overall? Yes. But would I still recommend it? Yeah, I probably would. I think the pros definitely outweigh the cons in this case. That said, I do hope that you enjoyed this video today. If you did, please be sure to click that thumbs up button and subscribe with notifications on so you don't miss out on any of my upcoming Fiji, New Zealand, Bali, and Taiwan content. Oh, and thanks for watching till the end.